Israel, tasty tie. I'll give you the names. <laughs> um, at the weekend, it was Benai Saknin and Beitar Jerusalem. Now, Benai Saknin are the only Arab club um, in the Israeli Premier League, so that does create one or two tensions, and it seemed to, to do so a lot over the weekend. Or uh, did it? <coughs> well, that's the question. I mean, they had this matchup with um, Beitar Jerusalem, as you touched on, sort of their. Uh, Jewish rivals, and obviously there's a lot of history there between. Well, in in the region, obviously it's a very delicate situation. So this was this was a match that was originally banned, but uh, they managed to get it together, but with a huge amount of security. Excellent. Do you want some more detail on this? I would love some. Excellent. We now have a Middle Eastern football expert, James Montague. James, are you there? I'm here. How are you doing? Yes, we're great. Thank you so much for coming on. So yeah, can you give us a little bit more background about this derby? Basically, I mean, I first went to um, Israel in 2006 and saw this kind of derby, this nascent derby. It's only a very recent derby. It's nothing that hasn't existed for 100 years. I mean, in a way, I guess it has, but um, even longer than that. Um, but in 2006, you know, I, I went to Sakhnin and I visited um, uh, beneath Sakhnin, the football club there that represents or has become to represent the 20% of the Arab population that lives within Israel. And, um, it was always viewed very suspiciously, you know, and then there's always been problems um, with some elements in Israeli society with Beitar, I mean, sorry, with Benny Saknin kind of wearing their Arab identity so proudly on their, on their chest. But really, it's been in opposition to Beitar, who are extremely um, right wing, um, uh, devoutly Jewish, and you hear very religious songs on the terraces. Um, I mean, I've, I've visited the Teddy Stadium on, on numerous occasions, and you, you kind of hear some of um, the chants, which you would, which you would class as racist, which would, would get people uh, and clubs banned for, for you know numerous games, uh, almost anywhere else in Europe. But it's kind of accepted with Beitar, and they also have a policy of not assigning Arab players. Now they had a policy of not assigning Muslim players, but largely because the fan group La Familia, which is their ultras group, um, kind of who have been extremely violent, and attacked the offices of. Um, the FA, even, even the own club, if they disagree with some of their policy, uh, they could have promised a riot if they would ever sign an Arab or Muslim player. And they famously signed uh, a couple of seasons ago uh, two Chechen players who were Muslim, and there was a big opposition on the um, terraces to that. Um, half the stadium turned their back on them when they made, a, made their you know, debut. So, um, you know, it's in that context where, you know, both of these clubs, in a way, they're kind of a bellwether for various different aspects of Israeli society on the Beitar side. You know, this is a club that is kind of intimately connected to Likud. Um, you know, you see a lot, of, a lot of settlers wearing, wearing, you know, the yellow and black Beitar flags when you go into the West Bank and, and go into Israel, um, into more kind of controversial areas. Um, and, you know, on the other side, with, with the Arab identity, you really see um, a kind of hardening position of that Arab identity as they've become more marginalised in Israeli society in the past few years. So, you know, when I went there, I'm Abbas Suwan, who was the, the captain and leader of the team, played for the Israeli national team, was proud to play for Israel, was proud to be an Israeli citizen. But at the moment, you've got a situation where a law is being pushed through the Knesset saying that, law, that Arab citizens will be given a second, essentially will be second-class citizens. The law would favour um, the kind of Jewish character and identity of the Israeli state. Um, so as they have become marginalised, um, you know, their identity has become much more aggressively pro-Palestinian. So you see now chants, and you hear chants about Al-Aqsa Mosque, um, you know, um, Palestinian flags being brought into the ground much more readily, and, you know, and with Beitar, you also see, you see many more um, it incidents of... of of kind of violence, and I think you know, it's, 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 it's the fact that this has become so heated and become a, a, a almost national security issue. So it says a lot about Israeli society at the moment. But do you think the the Israeli FA themselves are they are they quite determined and passionate about separating football from religion and politics, or could we be quite critical of them? Well, I mean, we can talk about it, but you, I mean, you can't, it's like trying to separate politics from football, or religion from football, like trying to. I don't know, separate air from humans. It's, it's impossible. It, it bleeds into it. And I think almost, not, I mean, even FIFA and the IOC have now kind of admitted that it's almost impossible to separate the two. You know, 
you can't. I mean, they, they do what they they do what they do, and it's always been a security issue um, with Sakhnin and uh, with, with Beitar. But I mean, in, in terms of the FA, I mean, it, it's it's kind of there are very few institutions where Arab Israelis feel that they are, to use a pun or cliche, you know, are playing on a level playing field. You know, they are much poorer than. Um, they're okay. Jewish countrymen, uh, there's higher instances of unemployment and there's the, the, the talk of, kind of massive workplace discrimination. At the moment, there's a policy of people leaving their shopping trolleys uh, and, uh, full of food, filling them up and leaving them in supermarkets in Israel to protest the fact that Israeli Arabs are being um, hired <laughs> in these companies. So, um, so in, in that respect, actually, football has been something of a, you know, it's a meritocracy and it turns out that Many of the players in Israel that are very good happen to be Arab Israeli players. So there's been mixed teams, mixed terraces. Look at so like Hapoel uh, and um, Maccabi Haifa being a great example of this. Teams that have a natural constituency in the community of Arabs have had Arab players and they've had Arab fans. So in a way, football is is kind of you know one of the few areas where there is some kind of equality. Um, I mean, it's not perfect. I mean, you can see the fact that there was. You know, chanting like Muhammad is dead, and we swear on the menorah there'll be no Arabs here. The fact that it has a long way to go, and there is something very troubling happening in Israeli society. I think but we have to we have to leave it there. But just uh, just just to be clear, am I right that everything went relatively smoothly? Um, yeah, so it's, no, yeah. no crowd well, troubles. Um, but Benny Sakhnin won one nil, so I guess there's, you know some people were happy. But there's a few arrests and the toilets were busted up. But okay. there, was, there was a thousand, there was a thousand police there. So. Okay, cool. Well, we'll look, we'll look forward to speaking to you um, potentially next week or in the coming weeks and um, talk about the Asian Cup or indeed the Golf Cup, which is the finals tomorrow. So we're going to keep our eyes on that. We might report back yeah. on that next week. Until then, James, thank you so much for filling us in. Really appreciate all the detail and the insight there. Much appreciated. Take care. We'll speak no to worries. you soon.